Are copper peptides like GHK the most underrated hair loss treatment to try in 2026? Or are they just another sound scientific trend with very weak proof? Today I'm gonna break down the most talked about peptides for hair, what the research actually shows, and where peptides realistically fit compared to finasteride and minoxidil. Remember, this video is not medical advice, so if you're treating hair loss, talk to a qualified doctor. To understand peptides, think of building blocks. Amino acids are the smallest pieces. Proteins are long chains of amino acids, and peptides are the short chains in between, like little messengers that can influence what cells do. And yes, because peptides exist naturally in the body, people assume natural equals safe equals effective. But natural does not automatically mean it works for male pattern hair loss, and it definitely doesn't mean that the evidence is strong. And before we jump in, while everybody's waiting for the next miracle hair treatment, don't forget that the basics still win. And that's why this video is sponsored by Ulo, and I partnered with them because they are one of the few companies doing personalized science-based hair loss plans that are built around the latest hair loss research and optimized for safety. So if you prefer structure, then the random trial and error, go check them out. Now the most famous peptide in hair and skin circles is undoubtedly GHK, which stands for glycine, histidine, and lysine. And it can bind to copper, creating the GHK copper variation, also called copper tripeptide 1. So you will often hear claims like this. In plasma, GHK levels are higher when you are young and lower when you are older. Now, this is a real thing that has been shown in the literature, but what matters more for hair loss is the next question. If it's already in the body, does adding more topically to the scalp do anything meaningful for hair follicles. And that's the entire debate of this video. Let me introduce to you my evidence checklist. So before we look at studies, let's get something straight. A clinical human study is not the following. It is not a Wikipedia paragraph. It's not a Reuters article. It's not a TikTok explanation. It's not even a gene expression chart. It's not a petri dish study or animal study on mice. Now, those things can be interesting, but they don't really prove a treatment works in real humans with real androgenetic alopecia. So if somebody says copper peptides are a no-brainer, you gotta try them out, your next question should always be, show me the human data. And so the most cited study in this area is from 2016 and it involved 45 men with male pattern hair loss. But here's the important detail. It wasn't pure GHKCU. It was a topical complex called Alavax, a combination of 5-ALA and GHK used daily for six months compared to placebo. There were three groups. Group A, there was a higher dose of this topical solution, including the GHK. Group B, with a lower dose, of the GHK and the amino acid, and group C was a placebo. So here's what happened. Hair thickness, no statistically significant improvement. Hair length, no significant improvement. How about hair count? It increased more in the treatment groups than the placebo, which is good, but if we look at the patient satisfaction levels on the overall hair assessment, it was still pretty low overall across many groups, to the point where people were almost equally dissatisfied in the treatment group as in the placebo group. So yeah, there is a signal in hair count, but if a treatment truly transforms hair, you usually see improvements people actually feel and notice, not just the number going up on a chart, while the satisfaction is like, mm, not really. And that's why I do not really consider this a breakthrough study on copper peptides in hair growth. And so beyond this peptide study in humans, the rest of the peptide hair evidence is mostly animal studies. Animal studies can be useful, especially for the mechanism, but hair loss models in animals are often very artificial. Some are actually chemotherapy-induced hair loss models that's not the same environment as long-term androgen-driven miniaturized of the follicles in humans. So yes, you will find animal papers suggesting copper peptides may influence growth signals, but it's still a lower tier of evidence overall. 
And now let's come to the cosmeceutical peptide blends you will see in hair serums. Let's start with the Capixil blend. And this one is usually centered around acetyl tetrapeptide 3, often paired with red clover extract. And then we have Procapil, and this blend is often described as biotinyl GHK or tripeptide 1. It also includes epigenin, which is a plant flavonoid, and oleanolic acid, which is a plant-derived compound often discussed in the DHT context, but kind of like a natural DHT inhibitor. But here's the problem. Most studies on these blends are not really clear clear peptide studies. They often include vitamins, they often include minerals, botanical extracts, or multiple actives in one serum. These studies have mixed populations where men and women are included in one study with way different diagnoses for their hair loss. So here's the marketing trap I see many people fall into. When you hear something like, clinically proven copper peptide regrows hair, it's often a mashup of one lab study being treated like a clinical trial or one peptide being swapped for another people mixing up evidence on GHK copper peptides versus evidence on other peptides and assuming it's the same evidence, but it's not. Also, people might be confusing animal results being presented like human results on copper peptides or combination formulas being presented like this one ingredient did it all. As far as safety, topical cosmetic type of peptides versus compounded injectable peptides are very different worlds. FDA has also warned that compounded injectable drugs containing copper peptides may pose immunogenicity risks and have limited human safety data. In the US, most peptides should have the research use only labels, and even then, they don't automatically make a peptide product safe, so proceed with caution. So here's my honest conclusion on peptides. They are interesting and they might become part of the future hair protocols, but right now the evidence just is not strong enough to treat them as the main treatment for androgenetic alopecia. So if you're actively losing hair, you probably don't have time to gamble on low evidence options while miniaturization continues month by month. So if you want to use peptides, it should be a layer you add on top of your fundamentals, like like using finasteride. The goal is not to try everything. The goal is to still have enough hair left to work with once you get your hands onto the right treatment that can actually protect that hair, thicken the hair, and maybe even grow new hair on top. Are copper peptides or any of their analog peptides that type of treatment? No. So what is your stance on peptides? And if you have tried peptides, comment your results below and what exact product you have used. Thank you so much for watching and until next time.